So I suppose I'm unmuted. I suppose that therefore I I'm seen by the participants. Okay, I would uh, like to welcome uh, everybody, particularly and very first uh, Hans Tupi, our member, and his wife Erika Tupi. Oh, I don't know whether I should speak German. No, I keep I, I stay with English. And I would particularly welcome also our today's speaker, Caroline Luger. Uh, I'm very happy that our co-host uh, of the Hans Tupi Lectures, the rector of the University of Vienna, Heinz Engel, is also here and will say a few words afterwards. Uh, I would like to say a few words to Hans Tupi, and I hope these words are correct, but Professor Tupi, you can correct me afterwards, certainly. Uh, uh, some important uh, points in, in your career. 1949, uh, you joined uh, in Cambridge, Fred Sanger, upon uh, 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 some uh, help or coordination by, by Perutz, Max Perutz, who in 58 received the Nobel Prize for his work on the structure of insulin. Uh, I would like to mention that it, in his uh, Nobel speech, uh, Sanger mentioned you uh, a couple of times with the, on, uh, with the sentence, which, which basically has become quite well known, a tappy worked too hard. So uh, I would like to, to mention mentioned that uh, uh, that that uh, the, the career afterwards 1951 return to Vienna after some stay at the Carlsberg lab laboratory in Denmark in 58 professor at the uh, University of Vienna in 63 full professor and chair uh, at the Institute of biochemistry at the medical faculty of the University of Vienna. I would like to also specifically mention and acknowledge the important contributions uh, Professor Tupi made to the Austrian research landscapes. Uh, he is really a, a great example for a, for, a, for a leading scientist to take responsibility for how, how science is is run in the country and also contributed to, to science policy. Uh, I understand that uh, you are you were you were uh, one of the leaders for the Österreichische uh, Forschungsförderungsgesetz, uh, uh, which led to the creation of the of the FWF, the Austrian Science Fund, which until today enjoys autonomy from, from politics. This happened in 1967. Uh, uh, Professor Tupi was then himself president of the FWF from 1974 to 1982, and from 1983 to 1985, uh, 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 rector of the University of Vienna, and 85 to 87, uh, he was he was uh, 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 president of the Austrian Academy of Sciences, and eighty seven to eighty nine uh, to uh, as minister for, for for science and research. So this in this function there were a number of very important uh, uh, contributions by Professor Professor Tupi, particularly to the quality and excellence of science as it is done in Austria to this day. In a sense, I appreciate that Professor Tupi, or that, that let's turn it around, that Rector Engel and myself are successors of Professor Tupi in our respective functions. Uh, from the distinctions and honors, I would like to mention the Austrian Ehrenzeichen, the Cross of Honor for, for Science and Arts. Uh, this is the highest 
a distinction a scientist can receive in Austria. The Wilhelm in 1975, the Wilhelm Exer Medal in 1978, the Ludwig Wittgenstein Prize in 2002, the large prize of Cardinal Initza is a, is a top prize given by the, by the Catholic Church. The great uh, uh, Golden Cross of Honor with star, which is something special for his uh, uh, achievements, contribution to the Republic of Austria. Among others, Professor Tupi is member of the, of the Pontifical Academy in the Vatican and member of the German National Academy, Leopoldina. Uh, I think words ca cannot be enough to appreciate uh, your contributions to science and to science politics and so, and so on in Austria. I would now like to pass the word on to Professor Engel for a few for a few words of welcome. Sehr geehrte Herr Professor Tuppi, ähm, sehr geehrte Frau Professorin Luger, meine Damen und Herren, ähm, ich kann nicht mehr viel ergänzen. Ich spreche jetzt ab, äh, in, zur Abwechslung Deutsch. Ich begrüße Sie als Rektor der Universität Wien. Die Akademie der Wissenschaften und die Universität Wien veranstalten die Tupi Lectures. Wir haben heute die sechste Tupi Lecture ähm, gemeinsam und jeweils mit abwechselnder Federführung. Äh, wir haben äh, zum 90. Geburtstag von Professor Tupi diese Lectures ihm sozusagen als Geschenk der beiden Institutionen gegeben. Wir hatten nun etwas mehr als ein Jahr pandemiebedingte Pause. Die heutige Tupi Lecture hätte schon vor einem halben Jahr stattfinden sollen. Wir haben sie damals verschoben, weil das damals nur online möglich gewesen wäre, in der Hoffnung, die bis vor wenigen Tagen, äh, ich sehe gerade, I think several people cannot hear anything. Kann mir irgend, irgendjemand mitteilen, ob man mich hört? Oh, I cannot, I, I hear you clearly. Okay, because somebody wrote, uh, jemand hat geschrieben, a lot of people cannot hear every, anything. Okay, also wir hören Sie gut, steht hier, ich setze fort. Uh, wir hatten damals gehofft, nach einer Verzögerung, uh, die uh, Vorlesung von Frau Professorin Luger live hören zu können. Das war bis vor wenigen Tagen auch noch der Status Quo. Frau Luger hatte sich auch bereit erklärt, kurzfristig nach Wien zu kommen. Leider hat uns der Lockdown der Bundesregierung diese Möglichkeit genommen. Ähm, deswegen herzlichen Dank, Frau Professorin Luger, dass Sie bereit sind, äh, dieses Experiment zu wagen, diese Tupi Lecture online zu geben. Ähm, wir werden sehen, ich glaube, es sind sehr viele Teilnehmer und Teilnehmerinnen anwesend. Ähm, zu Hans Tupi hat der Herr Präsident Zeilinger eigentlich fast all, eigentlich alles gesagt, aber ich möchte noch einen kleinen Aspekt erwähnen. Ähm, ein Beitrag von Hans Tupi, der damals vielleicht eine kleine, als Kleinigkeit angesehen wurde, aber große Wirkung hatte, nämlich seine Entscheidung als Bundesminister, die Einschränkung, dass die Unterrichtssprache an Österreichs Universitäten Deutsch zu sein habe, fallen zu lassen und damit zu ermöglichen, dass auch in anderen Sprachen, insbesondere in Englisch, unterrichtet werden konnte. Die Internationalisierung der österreichischen Universitäten, insbesondere natürlich der Universität Wien, wäre durch diese wurde erst durch diese richtungsweisende Entscheidung möglich. Also zu den vielen Verdiensten von Hans Duppi möchte ich dieses noch besonders erwähnen. Hans Duppi ist sicherlich der österreichische Wissenschaftler und Wissenschaftspolitiker, der am allermeisten die Entwicklung der österreichischen Forschung und der österreichischen Universitäten seit 1945 beeinflusst hat. Wie gesagt, heute erstmals online. Ich möchte jetzt nichts mehr weiter sagen, sondern an Frau Professorin Pater übergeben, die die Vortragende vorstellen wird. Hallo, ja, hört man mich? Ist alles klar? Ja, ja, ich höre Sie gut. Ja. Uh, so now when I uh, can take over, so I want to introduce our guest speaker for this 
sixth Hans Tupi lecture. And uh, first, most I want to also greet all the uh, participant at this uh, lecture, and I hope you will have uh, such a good time like we will probably have. So uh, to say a few words about uh, Professor Luger, she was born and raised in Vorarlberg, and she did her, she started her study in Innsbruck in microbiology and uh, biochemistry. For her PhD, she went to the University of Basel uh, to the lab of Kaspar Kirscher, uh, who did protein engineering and uh, biophysics, where she probably learned all the important stuff about uh, protein <laughs> interactions. Uh, 1990, uh, she went to the ETH of Zurich to the famous lab of Tim Richmond. Tim Richmond uh, has, uh, was professor for biophysics and uh, X-ray structure of biological macromolecules. And it was there uh, she, uh, she cleared the, the crystal structure of the nu nucleosome core particle. Uh, nine, 1999, she went to the Colorado State University in Fort Collins uh, to start her own uh, research group there. And she was very successful because since 2005, she is uh, the very, she got the very prestigious Howard Hughes investigator. Uh, position there, which means there is a lot of money for research. In 2015, uh, she got a call from the University of Colorado Boulder, uh, where she now has the Jenny Smalley Caruther Endowed Chair of Biochemistry. And it's also there she has done a lot of her important research. She is an elected member of the National Academy of Sciences and also an elected member of the European Molecular Biology Organization, EMBO. So Professor Luca is very uh, well known for her research in nucleosome structure and dynamics. So when she started that, she really um, did a lot of structures from uh, different nucleosomes with different uh, histone. Uh, and she got also interested in how, in the dynamics of how nucleosomes are formed and uh, how they dissociate again. So she also got interested in how histone chaperones and the assembly factors of uh, the chromatin work to build the uh, real chromatin structure. Uh, not last but not least, of course, chromatin is very much important for uh, transcription, for the transport of the information from DNA uh, to RNA. And this is also one of her main subject, how transcription uh, works in the context of a full chromatin. Lately, she now got interested in the evolution of nucleosomes because nucleosomes must be one of the first big uh, biomolecular complexes which might have been built. And actually, this is probably what we're going to hear tonight. Uh, so we have how it all began. Dynamic genome organization in humans, ancient uh, bacteria, and giant viruses. So this will be uh, the real uh, interesting uh, talk we will hear tonight. 
and uh, to say a few words why uh, I think this is a good Hans Tuppe lecture. Uh, Professor Hans Tuppe has worked on many different uh, items, uh, not only protein sequences, he also has worked, I mean, in the, in the middle 60s already on DNA. So he has worked on uh, mitochondrial uh, DNA with Gottfried Schatz together. And I think that makes a good connection why he probably is utmost interested in what's new about uh, how DNA is packaged and how nucleosomes are formed. Uh, with this, um, I want just to make a few administrative remarks for the people. So we will hear the lecture now. And after that, there is a Q, uh, Q and A. It's a written F and A tool, Frage und Antwort tool, where you uh, can write uh, your questions. I will uh, read them and Professor Luger will answer them. So don't write it in the chat function. This is for a different uh, uh, thing. So just use the Frage and Antwort tool to uh, place uh, your questions. And with this, uh, without you know, taking too much time, which will we need for uh, your talk, so welcome, uh, Frau Professor Luca. We are looking very much forward uh, to your talk. Ja, um, herzlichen Dank für die überaus freundliche Einführung und, und besonders herzlichen Dank für die Einladung um, an dieser sehr traditionsträchtigen Vorlesungsserie zu sprechen. Es ist, es ist mir eine große Ehre, um, für einen der Pioniere der Biochemie um, eine Named Lecture zu halten. Und äh, leider ist es alles virtuell, also dieser wunderschöne Hintergrund hier. Ich hätte das wirklich gerne live gemacht, äh, hoffentlich ein anderes Mal. Aber wenn wir eines gelernt haben bei dieser Pandemie, ist, dass wir flexibel sind und dass wir das Beste draus machen können. Und so äh, sind wir alle hier. Und ich werde jetzt auf Englisch weitersprechen, weil äh, Wissenschaftsdeutsch ist doch ziemlich schwierig für mich. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm really thrilled to take you on this journey uh, of our explorations of genome organization in, in the three domains of life and, and using structural biology and biochemistry as a tool to understand uh, some of the big mysteries of life, which is how cells differentiate and how, they, um, how we age and how possibly uh, they develop diseases through cancer. So. Um, most of you, when you see this picture, you just see a cute toddler. And some of you who might be physicists will deduce correctly that this toddler just went down a slide because her hair is electrostatically charged and sticks out in all directions. But when a cell biologist sees this uh, picture, um, I, I see an assortment of about 30 trillions of cells. The human body is composed of a vast number of cells that can be roughly classified into about 200 different cell types. And these cell types look very, very different. I just show a couple of examples here. They look very different in, in their appearance and they also have very different functions. Yet they all have the exact same blueprint of life that is encoded in the DNA. And that is because they're all derived from one single fertilized egg cell that contains all the information to build a, a being that is as complicated as, um, as a human. So uh, it is uh, what, what determines cell fate and differentiation. So which, which cell type um, gets developed and gets made is determined by which parts of the blueprint of life is read. So this is a little bit like having the building plan for a house. And if you are just there to build the bathroom, you will only look at the sections of the building plan that uh, involves bathroom things. And so this is pretty much how cells operate and how cells decide which regions of the genome to read to develop into these very specific cell types is really one of the big mysteries of life. Now, uh, the, the 
building plan is encoded in linear form in DNA, uh, this beautiful structure, the double helix, um, and on a chemical basis, the information is encoded in four chemical bases or letters, if you will, A, C, Gs, or Ts. So these, uh, these are the four bases of the DNA and the succession of uh, these four letters will determine uh, the building block, the building instructions for all life. Now, uh, because uh, we are very uh, complicated uh, organisms, we have large and complicated building plans. And uh, if you took all the letters in the human genome and wrote them into phone books, you would fill about a thousand phone books with combinations of just four letters, A, C, Gs, and Ts. And to the younger folks in the audience, a phone book is something where you actually go in and you look up the phone number of a person in alphabetical order. So this was before we had uh, contacts on your iPhones. So uh, there's a pretty good analogy for the organization of information in linear form, and that is uh, the cassette tape that some of you may also remember. Um, and, and you can also remember what happens when your cassette tape, when something goes wrong with it, all the information, all the tape spills out, and you have a big problem, the information is no longer accessible. And so, uh, so the challenges for the human genome are very similar to what we see in a cassette tape. We have to package the information in a very highly confined space, a very thin linear thread of DNA has to be fit into, uh, into a confined space, the nucleus. Uh, an analogy would be we have about 16 kilometers of a thread in a, in a, in a volume that is as small as a golf ball. And we have to package this in a way to protect from physical damages and tangles. We have to um, be able to accurately duplicate the genome during cell divisions because each daughter cell will obtain the, uh, the entire building plan, a perfect copy of the entire building plan. And in order to differentiate ourselves properly, we have to find the required genes in a timely manner. And so this is almost like finding uh, 17 needles in a haystack in a very ordered manner and in record time. And we have to physically access the stored information as well. All of these processes are very delicate and very vital to life. And if they go wrong, um, this results in cancers and other diseases. And so it's really, really important to understand how this all works at a fundamental level. Now, eukaryotes, uh, human beings and other multicellular organisms have developed quite an ingenious way to organize their DNA. And this is by forming a complex with an equal mass of proteins to form a large nucleoprotein complex that's collectively termed chromatin. At the most fundamental level, histone proteins, the small proteins form tiny little protein spools. Um, and each of these little protein spools uh, wraps a very, very small segment, segment of the genomic DNA around itself. And then hundreds and thousands of nucleosomes, these so-called nucleosomes, like beads on a string, are then compacted further into higher order structure who's, uh, that we don't really understand that well. At the most compacted level during cell division, um, this gives rise to the chromosome. And this is probably the picture that most of you have when you think about the genome is these compact little sausage-like chromosomes. But uh, when, a gel when a cell is just sitting there and doing its job, uh, chromatin structure is much more, um, much more loose. And so the compaction and decompaction of chromatin is quite dynamic. Now, we were really interested in what is the structure of the nucleosome? What can this tell us about how access to the genome is regulated? And finally, uh, I, will, I will tell you about who invented the nucleosome. So today's menu, our talking points will be, we'll talk a little bit about structure biology of chromatin. And in particular, I will tell you a little bit about the general methodology that we use uh, to obtain high resolution structures and why do we need structures and what is this concept of high resolution all about. We will then talk very briefly about uh, some of the machinery that is required to decode and navigate the nucleosome to get access to the genomic DNA. And then finally, uh, we will talk, I'll tell you about our most recent research about the 
possible evolutionary origin of histone-based chromatin in other domains of life. So let's jump right in it and let's think about high resolution structure. Why do we need high resolution structures? We need structures to understand function. If you have a picture of a hand, you can understand uh, quite well what this hand might be doing. And it's even better if you obtain a picture of your hand in various states of movement. And structural biology is really, really interested in obtaining these pictures of the machines in our body in different states of doing their job. Now, uh, most structural biology methods um, give rise to electron density envelopes. So this is a little bit like finding a glove on the street and then from that glove trying to deduce the function. Now, the tighter that glove fits, like in this example here, the more uh, information we can get. And as we are going to medium resolution and even low resolution, it becomes harder and harder to understand um, the precise function of, of our hand. And for example, in this case here, we might be tempted to think that our hand consists of a large pedal and then one opposable thumb, which really is not a good reflection of the reality. And so this is why structural biologists, when you talk to them, are always obsessed about high resolution, which means uh, that we are able to see as much detail as possible in the structures that we are interested in. Uh, there's really two main approaches uh, right now to determine structures of biological samples at this high resolution, and we're using both. X-ray crystallography uh, involves obtaining crystals. Uh, these then uh, are illuminated by X-ray beams, by hard X-ray beams, giving rise to diffraction patterns, patterns, and from these, we can arrive at electron density maps. Cryo-electron microscopy is a little bit different. We embed our sample of interest in a very thin film of vitreous ice uh, in, in random orientations. And from that, we can calculate two-dimensional class averages. And from that, we can then also calculate electron density maps. And so this is where the high resolution comes in. Uh, in this particular case here, we can see amino acids and we can see water molecules um, at exquisite resolution, we can see bond lengths, we can see amide atoms. And so this really is structural biology at its finest, if you will. Uh, this is quite easily obtainable with uh, X-ray crystallography. And in recent years, cryo-electron microscopy has developed in leaps and bounds, which is now also allowing us to obtain this type of resolution. Uh, from these types of experiments, we obtain so-called electron density maps, and this allows us to then fit atomic models into these electron density maps. This is uh, a depiction that shows every atom that we can see uh, with its bonds, uh, and this is quite un unwieldy and not that easy to and to understand. And so structural biologists often resort to these more stylized representations of our structures, uh, which really kind of takes away again from the resolution, but is a much easier way to understand the large uh, properties, um, the, the large scale properties of the, of the complex under investigation. So using these approaches, uh, we've determined the three-dimensional structure of the nucleosome. This was work that I did many, many years ago as a postdoc. In this little animation, I just want to drive home the point that these are dynamic assemblies. They start with a stepwise deposition of histones, the little proteins, onto DNA. And then the DNA is wrapped around these little protein cylinders in, um, in a very tight superhelical uh, coil. Now, um, um, and this gives rise to, to these canonical structures of nucleosomes that, that are now uh, present in, in every biochemistry textbook, which of course is, is a source of great uh, pride uh, to all of us who've worked on this particular uh, structure. Now, uh, wh what does this mean, getting back to the genome, what does this mean for the genome? If we look at the DNA that is wrapped around this little protein spool here, and I'm only showing half of it, you can see there are several properties that really profoundly affect access to the genomic DNA. First of all, the DNA forms a highly distorted left-handed superhelix around this little protein cylinder. You can also see that one face of the DNA here on the inside 
is completely occluded by binding to the histones, by binding to, to the protein. So if you are a protein that wants access to the DNA, you have to kind of pry it off the dead cold hands of the histones. And the histones hold onto the DNA at 14 independent interaction points um, shown here and here. Here's a little detail here for, the, for, for those of you who are a little more nerdy. Um, and you can see in exquisite detail uh, what kind of bonding patterns between the protein and the DNA backbone um, exist. Now, because the entire genome is organized by nucleosomes, this really has profound effects on how we utilize the genome. Nucleosomes determine the spatial and temporal axis to the genome, and so they help decide a cell. They help they help the cells to decide which regions of the genome to read at which time. Um, transcription, replication, and DNA repair machineries uh, require help to access the DNA, and so a large um, amount of energy in the cell is devoted to helping um, these factors to gain access to the nucleosomal DNA to unravel it. And there are cellular factors that specifically rec recognize features in the nucleosomes themselves. And this is what we generally call uh, epigenetic control. These are post-translational modifications on the histones that have profound effects on genome organization and uh, genome access. And, and uh, Quite, um, quite stunningly, this holds true for all eukaryotes, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later, but even the most primitive eukaryote has this very elaborate regulatory system imposed um, on the nucleosomes. Now, um, uh, let's just talk very briefly about the factors that are required to decode and navigate the nucleosome. How do you gain access to the wrapped DNA? How do you pry the DNA away from the hands of the histone? And uh, there's protein factors that do this, and we've, we're, we're busy working on several, one, several of these. Um, perhaps one of the most, uh, most important ones is this histone chaperone that is called FACT, and that stands for facilitates all chromatin transaction. This protein um, sits on top of the nucleosome. It unravels parts of the DNA, and then parts of it pretend to be DNA. So this blue noodle here presents, pre, uh, pretends to be DNA, and it hugs the histones to closer to the body of the remaining nucleosomes while the ends of the DNA are being worked on by polymerases and other factors. Um, fact is also very important because cancer cells appear to have a, a rather obscene amount of fact, uh, probably to fix broken nucleosomes. Um, we don't really know what cause and effect is, but it, it, it's quite interesting to, to, uh, to speculate that uh, targeting fact function potentially with some specific drugs might be used for cancer therapies. And that's something that we're kind of uh, starting to be really interested in and look at. Uh, a second class of factors um, that help access to the DNA, promote access to the DNA, use ATP hydrolysis. They, they require energy to, uh, to free up the DNA. This particular one uh, uses ATP hydrolysis to kind of slide up and down the nucleosomes. It also sits on top of the nucleosome and it can slide up and down using ATP hydrolysis, uh, quite a profound 30-degree uh, rotation. And by doing this, uh, it actually can help. And it, it is targeted to sites of interest, for example, a gene that we might want to express. It then, uh, it then uses ATP to unravel the DNA to make it free for the polymerase. And in fact, it, it completely uh, kicks the DNA out, and this protein factor then just binds to the histones alone. Um, after the polymerase is done with its job, uh, it will uh, it will help in the assembly reassembly of nucleosome. And so, this particular protein is a is an ATP dependent nucleosome disassembly and assembly factor. Again, helping um, helping the uh, polymerases to gain access to read the genes that they might need for them. Uh, in order to differentiate from a um, uh, stem cell, if you will, into a liver cell or, or a muscle cell. Um, and and a, a last point that I wanted to make about, uh, about nucleosomes in general is that nucleosomes are interaction hubs for nuclear factors. Um, 
remember I told you there's about 100,000, um, there's about 12 million nucleosomes uh, in the nucleus, so there's a lot of them. Uh, they all uh, distort the DNA in this profound manner. They have a distinct surface shaped by the histone proteins, and uh, the histone proteins themselves are the targets of post-translational or epigenetic modifications uh, that are indicated as these, as these little red flags here. And these literally are little red flags that tell the machinery that here is a nucleus that maybe we need to unravel so that we can transcribe it and we can make the messenger RNA and then make the protein for it. Now, uh, uh, as such, uh, nucleosomes exist in several different flavors, depending on which post-translational modifications or epigenetic modifications they carry. And so in a way, uh, this is a little bit like uh, the primary structure of an amino acid chain where the primary structure, which amino acids are there in which order, depends the two-dimensional and three-dimensional folding uh, of the protein, the resulting protein. It's very similar in, in chromatin. The primary structure of a nucleosome chain will determine its secondary structure and its tertiary structure. And this is profoundly affected also by interacting um, factors. Um, and so one, so, so we have the ability to have individual nucleosomes and fold them into different shapes, which then again will inform function uh, and ultimately access to the DNA. And one really profound example of this that I want to share with you is found at the centromere. What is the centromere? The centromere is a very specialized uh, structure uh, on each chromosome, and it is where the spindle axis attaches to rip the two sister chromatids apart once the genome has duplicated to distribute it evenly uh, to the two daughter cells. This of course is profoundly important because chromosome abnormalities that happen when this process goes awry um, are, are at the heart of many birth defects uh, that, that are known today. The centromere is exemplified, is, is epigenetically defined by the histone variant SEMP-A. Um, and uh, we, by taking a closer look at the centromere and the chromatin structure there, uh, we've discovered that uh, centromeric chromatin has a very different and very intriguingly ordered uh, chromatin structure using cryo-AM. Uh, we've developed, uh, we've, we've determined a three-dimensional structure of nucleosomal arrays that are defined by the specific epigenetic variant that's only found at the centromere and by its interacting protein that's also only found by at the centromere. And this is a three-dimensional structure uh, that we deduce from these two-dimensional class averages. Um, and this structure is very different to what you would normally find in chromosomes. And um, this in, serves then as the anchor point for the spindle proteins that pull the chromosomes apart. Now, um, with uh, let's uh, talk about nucleosomes in non-eukaryotic organisms because uh, I'm a microbiologist by training and I really, I'm always a little disturbed that we focus all of our research on a very, very small region of the evolutionary tree. And so I was really intrigued in what the evolutionary origin of chromatin is. And in order to understand uh, what I'm saying, I set the stage to what I'm saying is, I just wanna point out that uh, all life on this planet uh, can be organized in three domains three domains of life. Those are uh, eukaryota, of which we are part of, fungi and, and, um, and plants. There's a large class of bacteria that exist in all, um, in all environments. And then the third domain of life is archaea. These are bacteria-like organisms, single cellular organisms that live in very extreme, um, in very extreme um, environments, for example, they can live at extreme salt, they can live in deep vents under high pressure and 90 degrees Celsius, or they can live at extremely saturated salt solutions. And uh, as we were painfully aware of is that all of these life forms on earth are infected, uh, are afflicted by viruses. Um, and so I know you guys don't want to hear much more about viruses, but uh, viruses are omnipresent, they're part of life, and there's actually viruses that infect viruses, which I find pretty amazing. So uh, what you would normally do is, so, so historically, uh, it was thought that nucleosomes are a prerogative of 
uh, the domain of eukaryotes, so only eukaryotes have uh, nucleosomes. And so what you would do if you're interested in the evolutionary or, or origin of, you, of, of the nucleosome, you would go all the way down <clears throat> in the evolutionary tree and uh, check what kind of nucleosome structures these primitive organisms would, would, would make. Uh, it turns out that nucleosome structure is nearly invariant between all eukaryotes. So nucleosomes between um, Roger Federer and yeast, normal baker's yeast, are basically indistinguishable, even though the genome sizes between these two organisms is quite different. And then if you go way down in the evolutionary tree to uh, this lovely organism here that as cheerful looking as it is, is actually very uncomfortable because it, it uh, causes explosive diarrhea. These nucleosomes are also very, very similar uh, compared to human nucleosomes. And the reason for this is because uh, histones are amongst the most conserved eukaryotic proteins known. And so it turns out that early on our path towards being eukaryotes, we had to figure out this whole DNA compaction business and um, and, and it, it was nearly perfect in, in the current state and didn't really need to be improved further as we were becoming multicellular organisms and we developed into fungi and, and, and plants and animals. So what to do? Um, we need to look at other domains of life. And uh, it turns out that archaea, the whole domain of archaea, the majority of these organisms have some undiversified and minimalist histones. And this was discovered by John Reeve as early as in the 1990s. Uh, and so we were just asking the simple-minded question, what can archaea tell us about the or origin of the eukaryotic nucleosome? Now, um, what does it mean, simple, um, simple, undiversified histones? This means that unlike us, who have four different histone types that are quite unique, archaea only have one or two, and they are very similar to each other. And these guys can form homodimers, meaning they can join together to form asymmetric homodimers, whereas these guys have evolved to only pair H3 with H4 and H2A with H2B. Overall, the archaeal histones are also not very conserved compared to uh, eukaryotic uh, histones. And so uh, we really wanted to know whether these things can form nucleosomes and how these nucleosomes might, might look like. Now, if you look at the histone structure, you can determine a three-dimensional structure of just the histone dimers. They are very similar to the eukaryotic histone dimers. So this is in humans, this is in humans, these are the two little heterodimers, and this is a homodimer that we have in archaea. The exception is that, uh, the, the difference is that eukaryotic histones have a lot of additional stuff kind of hanging off of them that makes them unique, whereas archaea are just very minimalist. They're just confined to these 70 amino acids, and that's it. No tails, no places to put epigenetic modifications, just a simple framework of the histone dimer. So how does a single tailless histone organize DNA, and why do these organisms need histones? Um, and remember, the genome size between humans and these archaea is vastly different. And so arguably, they don't really need it to fit their DNA into the confines of their cells. But they might actually need them to withstand these really horrific uh, life uh, conditions that they have chosen to live and inhabit. Now, we solved the structure of uh, archaeal nucleosomes. and. Um, you can see here that this is archaeal dimer. It organizes the DNA in a very similar manner compared to the eukaryotic nucleosome. Um, and these similarities go down all the way to the protein DNA interaction phase interfaces. I'm just pointing out one of these here. And uh, the only point I want to make here is that there's 3 billion years between um, in, in evolution between here and here. And I'm just blown away by the profound similarities in how the DNA is organized. So all the way back when uh, we've already, Archaea already have figured out how to bend DNA into this profoundly distorted shape. And they've also figured out how to join two histone dimers together through these four helix bundles, uh, atomic 
uh, similarities between these four helix bundles are also quite profound. And so they have already figured out how to do that as well. And indeed, they have figured out how to make nucleosomes that look very, very similar to the eukaryotic nucleosomes, as you can see in this juxtaposition of the two, with the main differences that archaeochromatin just keeps going. It just keeps building on itself, forming the so-called continuous or endless nucleosomes, whereas the eukaryotic nucleosomes are limited to single particles. All right, why is that? Uh, this is because the eukaryotic histone octomer, the histones are limited to forming just an octomer, two copies each, whereas archaeal histones can build a helical ramp of uh, variable length, and this is uh, what then wraps the DNA. And so a good analogy for the structure that we find in archaea is kind of a slinky-like structure that's quite different to the defined particles where only two turns of DNA are wrapped at any given time in eukaryotes. Now, do these structures exist outside of the crystal lattice and in the cell? Because we were cheating a little bit and we crystallized a unit of just three histone dimers with 90 base pairs of DNA. And so we were really curious um, whether these exist um, outside uh, the crystal lattice in solution. Uh, the first thing we did, uh, and this was also because of COVID and these experiments are quite easy to do, we did molecular dynamic simulation of two different particles where we wrap more and more DNA. And you can see here, if you just have three dimers, what we actually try to crystallize, these things are pretty flexible. They flop open in a, in a molecular dynamic simulation. Whereas when you add additional histone dimers, these stay more closed and they're stabilized by wrapping. So conceivably, archaea can determine how stable their nucleosomes are, depending uh, on, on how many dimers they will join together to form, how many wraps of DNA they will actually make. Um, we then also wanted to know um, whether we could determine structures of these archaeal slinkies, as we call them, on a longer piece of DNA. And we again resorted to cryo-electron microscopy, uh, where we, where we uh, determined the structure of a 207 base pair DNA with seven histone dimers. So this is three more dimers than a normal eukaryotic nucleosome would have. And we get two different classes of structures, one that arguably looks like a nucleosome and another class that's not as, pre not as um, prevalent, but uh, still very uh, pronounced where nucleosomes are kind of, they seem to be kind of open like a book. So what is this? How can we fit this? The resolution of these structures wasn't as high, so this comes back to the whole resolution business, but enough to uh, allow us to fit four dimers and three dimers into, into these electron density. And so basically these are slinky structures that open at a right angle, just like a book. Um, this is showing, this shows an electron density flare just to emphasize that the DNA really is continuous and not just two nucleosomes kind of stuck together through some, um, through some intermolecular interaction. And so this is truly a slinky that has opened up partially. What about the other, the other, um, the, the more uh, prevalent class? This can be fit with five histone dimers. And so clearly uh, this is the beginning of a slinky, uh, but we are missing two dimers and 60 base pairs of the DNA. And so when we try to publish this paper, the reviewers rightfully called us out and say like, are you sure you can't see those missing two dimers and 60 base pairs of DNA? So we then went back and took a really close look at our 2D class averages. And if you squint, you can actually see uh, there's a little shadow of density here. It's really not very pronounced because it's probably quite dislocalized. And so it gets lost when you average millions of particles, it gets kind of smeared out. But uh, we could still, we still managed to build, uh, to build the remaining two dimers here. And again, you can also see this opening up of the slinky. And so we have a situation where we have uh, these endless nucleosomes that then stochastically open up in every different, uh, in different locations to provide access to the genome. Uh, and we know this because when you analyze uh, chromatin in the organism itself, 
uh, in the archaeon itself uh, using an enzyme that only cuts accessible DNA, you, you obtain a very regular 30 base pair pattern here. So we get cuts regularly every 30 base pairs, um, which is very consistent with the enzyme cutting stochastically every time between every histone dimer, which organizes precisely 30 base pairs. And this is again, very consistent with this stochastic opening and closing of nucleosomes that we observe by molecular dynamics and also by, um, by cryo-electron microscopy. And this is profoundly different from the pattern that we observe when we're doing the same experiment in humans, where we see a very characteristic 150 base pair pattern because these particles are very defined and harder to, uh, harder to uh, cut. And so we can only cut between individual particles, not within the slinky here. So we're pretty confident that these structures actually exist in the cell. And we also have data showing that they contribute to gene regulation. Now we have a situation where, where Archaea have actually figured out how to organize uh, and bend, bind and bend DNA in this profoundly distorted shape. We have these no frills histones that are really kind of reduced to the minimum. Um, they form a same as stable superhelix. Um, they impede polymerases, but don't inhibit them. Uh, and there's no evidence for epigenetic uh, modifications or chromatin remodelers. They're self-assembling. And uh, what we've done then for eukaryotes, even in the most primitive eukaryote, we've, uh, we've now diversified to four histones with tails. We have discrete stable particles from two different building blocks. And the price we pay for this is that this profoundly inhibits DNA dependent processes, but this is also an opportunity to use these structures to regulate access uh, to chromatin. And uh, they do require ATP dependent chromatin remodelers, those machines that I showed you in the beginning that kind of sit on top of nucleosomes and rip the DNA away from the histones. Now we were really curious, we still don't know, how did we get from here to here? Three billion years, we, even the most primitive eukaryote can do all of this. So what is the missing link? And so um, we, we stumbled upon a really weird um, life form, if you will, and that is giant viruses. Giant viruses are huge. This is a bacterium here. This is a normal size of a bacterium. These are giant viruses. For the longest time, people thought these were actually bacteria because they were so large. And um, um, they are called nucleocytoplasmic large DNA viruses. That's kind of um, neither here nor there. But uh, like the last thing we need right now is more viruses, but these things uh, mostly infect amoeba, water dwelling, unicellular organisms. So uh, we don't have to worry too much about that at least. One subclass of these viruses uh, have very large genomes and they encode histone-like proteins. And so we were really curious what these nucleosomes might look like. And these histones were very strange because unlike eukaryotic histones, again here, with these very distinct chains and extensions, these things were now duplexes. They were fused together. So H2B and H2A form one protein chain and H4 and H3 form one protein chain. And for reasons I don't want to get into, um, th this was very hard to envision how this might function structurally. And so we decided uh, to make these uh, nucleosomes, these viral nucleosomes in vitro in the test tube and determine their structure. So the question that we had is, can they bind DNA? Can they form nucleosomes? If yes, what are their properties? How are they assembled? Are they presented in the, are they present in the virus? And why do they need their own histones? Now, um, we determined the structure of these, uh, of these viral histones bound to DNA on two different lengths of DNA. And uh, without belaboring the point, they kind of sort of do look like nucleosomes, which is shown in this superposition here. In gray, you see the human nucleosome. In colors, you see the viral nucleosome. It looks a little different in terms of the DNA, but by and large, the histones kind of do the same thing. And uh, 
with the exception that uh, the ends of the DNA in these viral nucleosomes are splayed open quite profoundly. And so these things are quite destabilized, uh, which is kind of what they might have to do because as soon as these viruses infect the whole cell, they need to strip their histones to make the DNA accessible so that they can duplicate and, and go by their nefarious um, purpose, which is to kill amoeba, presumably. Now, uh, they're also less positively charged. Uh, remember that DNA is highly negatively charged and because of the phosphate backbone. And as such, histones usually have carry the opposite charge so that we have charge-charge interactions. Um, in, in this representation, I've painted uh, positive charges in blue and negative charges in red. And you can see that the viral histones are quite, uh, they're not quite as blue as a eukaryotic histone. This is especially evident here. And this also contributes um, to, to this um, observed destabilization of, of these nucleosomes compared to uh, human nucleosomes. Um, I have a little video here that I think uh, that kind of summarizes uh, the structural, the results from the structure. You see that they look quite similar to eukaryotic nucleosomes. You can also again see this concept of resolution. These are not quite as high resolution as we might like, but the point I do want to make here is that um, remember these histones are connected by little connectors, uh, which structurally are quite hard to accommodate. And we were particularly interested in how that might happen. And uh, we do have the atomic details about how these connectors might be, um, might be accommodated and uh, how they contribute to the three-dimensional structure of, the, of these particles. So this region here is unique to the viral histones because we have learn to separate our histones and not have them connected. Now, why the virus feels the need to connect these histones into, uh, into a single chain is, is really not known, but we're curious to find out. Now, um, I want to finish with, with some cell biology because uh, one of the one of the really pertinent questions here is why on earth uh, do viruses have histones and where do they go? How do they know where to go? And to do this, we teamed up with Chantal Abergel in France um, who, who have discovered these viruses. Um, and uh, what we first wanted to know is where do these histones end up? And so we label them with green fluorescent protein, which is exactly what the name says. It's a fluorescent protein. And so you can look at it under the microscope. And so as a control, we first transfected amoeba with uh, amoeba H2A, host H2A. So when we do this, uh, this protein goes to the cell's nucleus. That's where it's needed. That's where it's going to go. And that's where it stays. And this actually, uh, it remains there as we infect these poor cells with the virus. So host uh, H2A, even when it's fluorescent tag, will stay where it's uh, supposed to be. When we do the same experiment with this duplex H2B, H2A histone, we will see that this histone has no idea where to go. It just kind of hangs out in the cytoplasm and, uh, and doesn't really know what to do with itself. But when we infect uh, the, this poor amoeba cell with a virus, it will go to what we call the viral factory. What is a viral factory? This is a region in the cytoplasm where there's massive viral DNA replication and massive virus assembly. So this is literally what it sounds like. This is where the new virus is made to then go out and infect more, um, more amoeba. And we see the exact same behavior for H4, H3 shown here. And so you can see that these histones massively accumulate in the viral factory. Um, we've done some uh, mass spectrometry, quantitative mass spectrometry of the virus itself to figure out whether these histones actually are needed in the virus capsid as it's going about and doing its nefarious business. And you can clearly see that the most abundant proteins, apart from these hypothetical proteins that we don't really know what they do, is H4, H3, and H2B, H2A. And this is about as abundant as the major capsid protein, uh, which is the protein that forms the proteinaceous shell around the virus. And so these histones are found in the virus. And when you do some fancy back of the envelope math, you can actually uh, deduce that you have enough viral histones to package the entire viral genome 
into nucleosomes. And so by, uh, as, as, as far as Occam's razor go, we assume that you have these histones, you have a lot of histones in the viral capsid. Um, these histones are known to make nucleosome-like structures in cell. And so we assume that in the virus itself, they will also organize viral DNA in the form of nucleosomes. Now, why does the virus need these histones? And so in order to, to answer this question, we need to talk a teeny bit about the life cycle of this virus. So the virus shown here with this little nucleosome inside, it has of course a lot of nucleosomes, will infect a cell, it will form viral factories, which are membraneless uh, organelles, if you will, where there's massive transcription and replication. The messenger RNA is then translated in the cytoplasm to form histones. These histones will not go to the nucleus as we've shown, but they will go back to the viral factory where they make, where they're packaged into viruses. These viruses are then uh, going out and infect more amoeba. Um, and in the process, the amoeba dies because it just bursts. Now, uh, are viral histones required for infectious particles? In order to answer this question, uh, Chantal's lab had to establish strategies to manipulate the viral genome, uh, which really was not uh, an established technique at that time. And this whole system is extremely difficult to work, it, to work with and to manipulate, but they've managed to pull this off in a tour de force. And they managed to make viruses where they knocked out histones H4, H3. So one of the histones were knocked out. Um, the virus particles actually assemble into viruses. They don't have the histones in them. They don't have nucleosomes. And when, uh, when they, uh, they can no longer infect uh, the amoeba, so the amoeba lives. Uh, and when you then, uh, just to make sure that it's really due to the knockout of H4, H3 and not due to some other uh, mismanipulation of the virus, if you replace, if you add back H4, H3 in a transiently transfected manner, we then get, um, again, infectious particles. And we know this because our amoeba dies a horrible death. So to answer these questions, histone doublets and giant viruses, we, as always in good research, we have some answers, but even more questions. They can bind DNA, they can form nucleosomes. They are a little bit destabilized compared to eukaryotic nucleosomes, and that might be required for the biology. How they are assembled, we have no idea, and we're really interested in determining who, which protein factors help in the ordered assembly onto DNA. Are they present in the virus? Yeah, they cover the entire viral genome. And uh, the virus needs its own histones, but why, we really have no idea yet, and we're really intrigued to find out. Similarly, and in a more technical question, why do those two histones need to be fused together? And so now that we have a way to manipulate the system, we can cut them apart and just see whether the virus will still want to be infectious or not. And just to bring it all home uh, for you, the journey that I've taken you on today, and uh, hopefully you're still here, uh, we talked a little bit about genome size and challenges for information access. And, and I've also told you about the awesome power of X-ray crystallography and cryo-EM. I like them both equally. I think they're just amazing and it just gives me great joy. Um, I've shown you a little, some little tidbits about how we assemble and navigate the nucleosome using protein factors, some with, some without ATP hydrolysis. And then finally, I've shown you that histone-based chromatin actually predates eukaryotes, was invented by archaea and possibly also by these quite old ancient viruses. And they're surprisingly similar to eukaryotic nucleosomes with some really uh, interesting differences as well. And so uh, with this, uh, I, I, will, uh, I want to acknowledge uh, my lab. I've, I've, I'm working with a terrific group of people. Um, my Nuke Evo group uh, at CU Boulder are listed here. And then uh, some really enjoyable collaborations with, uh, with various labs around the globe and including my former, um, my former postdoc, Francesca Matiroli at the Hubrecht Institute, who's just a fabulous scientist. And with this, I'm happy uh, to answer some questions if there are any. And uh, thank you all for showing up in this virtual space and, and uh, traveling with me uh, through the domains of life. Thank you very much. Yes, um, 
Okay, yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for this really fascinating lecture. Um, this is really uh, something I wouldn't have uh, thought of that viruses also have these nucleosomes. So um, I, I take the opportunity to ask the first question before other people start uh, uh, doing that. Um, so uh, are there other DNA viruses known which have this histone and are these, the second question would be, are these histones more related to the archaeal type or to the eukaryotic type? Yeah, that's a really good question. The, um, there are DNA viruses that uh, hijack host uh, histones, some of them do, SV40 and some others as well. So they use eukaryotic histones to package their genome. In terms of encoding their own histones, these are the only ones uh, that are known in this class of giant viruses. But uh, of course, uh, we are discovering new viruses every day. It's a large, there's a large dark space, dark world of, of viruses. And so we don't really know what we'll, what we'll find as, as people uh, poke down further into this area. Yeah. So people are mostly looking at the code structures, but, uh, you know, it's also similar to the RNA viruses where, you know, the, the packaging of the RNA is is also not very well in, in investigated. Would be yeah, it's very, it's very true because it's very hard to, to look at it uh, by, uh, by cryo-EM because viruses are symmetric and the inside really is not. Yeah, okay. So I see already a question for Christina Chinovich Karugo. Thank you very much for this inspiring talk highlighting the instrumental role of structure and biology in elucidating the molecular mechanism underlying the function of biological macromolecules. Where do you see growing structural biology in the future? <laughs> yeah, um, well, the future is definitely uh, cryotomography, um, basically using um, using a cryo-electron microscopy to look at the at at structures in the cell. And, and this has made a lot of advances in recent years. You, for some cells, you have to th embed them and thin slice them, uh, fib mill them, if you will, make very thin slices so that they're thin enough to be visualized. But, but looking, at, uh, looking at molecular structures in their natural context is definitely the future of uh, structural biology. Right now, we're still, grappling with resolution limits. Uh, so we're still at the status of maybe having, showing a mitten rather than a nice tight finger gloves. But I, this, this method, methodology is really developing very, very fast. Yeah. So there is an, uh, the first question. I can't see uh, who was this, but I can read, can you reconstitute the viral nucleosome if you express individual histones instead of the dimeric histones? Oh yeah, that's a really, really good question. Uh, I, I actually do believe we tried this and I think it didn't work very well. These nucleosomes are not easy to make in the first place. And so uh, splitting the, the, dimeric, the, the dimeric chains up into single chains uh, made things go uh, worse. We didn't really try that hard though. So uh, I'm not saying it cannot be done, but uh, it really didn't, didn't work that well on a first try. Another question, does the giant virus genome have any distinct feature that would require their own histone proteins for packaging? I'm thinking of the GC content or secondary structure, for example. Um, we haven't really found anything. They, they are pretty, they have a pretty generic GC content. Uh, there really wasn't that much, um, that much uh, to, to sink your teeth in. Uh, I, think, I, I think now that we can manipulate these viruses, uh, the genome of these viruses, we can ask a couple of these questions, but we just haven't gotten around to that quite yet. Mm. So I, I excuse myself for not uh, saying who was the question. Somehow my question and answer tool uh, 
is somehow on the edge and I just can read the, 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 the question. So there's another question. I think it's Frederic Bercher. Thank you for inspiring talk, Caroline. In the elegant experiment using GFB virus histone in amoeba, why do you think the viral histone is not incorporated into the amoeba genome? Yeah, thanks, Fred, for this question. Uh, we think it's because it doesn't have a clearly recognizable NLS, a nuclear localization sequence. And also, um, as you know, there is um, histone chaperones like NAP1 and others that transport eukaryotic histones into the nucleus. That's kind of what their job is. And we haven't really found anybody that interacts uh, with the viral histones. And so I think it's a simple, simple, um, simple case of nobody's there to transport them. Nobody tells them to go there. So they just hang out in the nucleus until the virus infects the cell. And then uh, there's a massive amount of DNA in the cytoplasm, which normally isn't where DNA is. And so then they just migrate to, uh, to the uh, viral factory because of the massive amounts of DNA that are present there. Ulrich Techner. Great talk, Caroline. In eukaryotes, the histone modifications are involved in activation expression of gene expression. Anything known how this is done in Archaea, which do not seem to have epigenetic modifications? Yeah, uh, so we, we have a few examples. Uh, we, we, we have done quite a few experiments on, on Archaea and um, the way we think. So let me begin by saying that there's no known instances of post-translational modifications of histones shown in archaea. Uh, what we think happens is that uh, these guys organize uh, access to the genome by how many wraps they have and where the histones are located. They also have other proteins that bind to DNA. And so just like in humans, there's nucleosome-free regions that will be accessible, uh, but they also probably regulate access by how many wraps they have around. And I've shown you that the more wraps we have, the more stable a particularly uh, hidden, uh, a particularly organized piece of DNA will be uh, bound. And, and if you just have like two or three wraps, that's much easier to access and to uh, read off. So another question would be, do you think a fusion of two archaeal mm -hmm. histone proteins could be functional? Yeah, I actually think it could be. Uh, these experiments are really fun to think about, but then um, if, if you think it through, uh, we always refrain from doing them because uh, evolution has pretty much perfected it. And so I think the only outcome that you can expect is that it becomes slightly less viable. Just you make things worse. It's very hard to make things better. In, in an organism that is 5 billion years old. Um, and so you make it a little worse and then people say, well, yeah, you, you, you putzed around with, with the histones and so you make it worse. So like, what's the big deal? So I think while it's fun to think about these kinds of questions, uh, realistically to test them is, is really hard because the outcome is almost predetermined, if you will. So there is no question here anymore. Um, I, I would like to have another question. Um, you know that the, the, why do they need histones anyhow, the viruses? I mean, there's not so much DNA. They don't have to wrap it around. So do you have any idea why this evolved in, in, in this and why is this so important then for the infection process? You know, we really don't have any idea whatsoever. We don't know what's happening in the capsid. And that comes back to the question you raised before. Mm -hmm. uh, it would really be fun to look at genome organization within the virus and maybe do some tomography and take a look. We don't really know what happens in the capsid, whether they need it there, whether they need it to properly eject their DNA into the host cell, or whether they need them to protect their DNA while it's in the host cell uh, in order to evade uh, defense mechanisms that, that uh, amoeba doubtlessly have to 
to combat these viruses. We don't really know about the timeline, how soon do the histones get shed from the DNA? And so there's a lot of unanswered questions that, that we're really dying to know the answer to. And so we're hard at work uh, looking at these things. So another question from Tao Jing. Very nice talk, and I learned a lot for the nucleosome-like particles of the virus. What contributes to the less stable structure beside the less positive charges? Is there any other evidence that shows that these nucleosomes are less stable as compared to the eukaryotic nucleosomes? Yes, there is, and I didn't show you the gory details. So for example, when you put these nucleosomes uh, on a gel, on a native gel, they, they run much higher, meaning that they're kind of more bloated and more expansive. If you put these nucleosomes on an atomic force microscopic, microscopic grid, uh, they, they actually just fall apart. And the same holds true when you put them on a cryo EM grid. And so we have to cross-link these particles in order to visualize them. So they really are metastable. Uh, we think they're metastable also because of these connectors. And I didn't really show you, I kind of brushed by the details, uh, but uh, these connectors uh, kind of go between the gyres of the DNA and they partially repel the DNA. And the entire nucleosome seems to be a little more expanded and not quite as tightly compacted as eukaryotic nucleosomes. Anton Legin, thank you for a great talk. Can we exclude the opportunity that giant viruses have stolen the nucleosomes from early eukaryotes? Yeah, excellent question. We cannot. Uh, there's different camps. Uh, some, some think there's enough evidence that the giant viruses predate uh, eukaryotes. Uh, there's other evidence that seems to me a little more parsimonious that, that says that they have, um, they have stolen them from some ancient uh, eukaryote. Uh, why they fused them, we don't really know. Uh, there's problems with both sets of explanations, and so I'm neither here nor there on this. I should point out, though, that there's another giant virus that um, has actually four separate histone chains. So those viruses, for some reason, don't have two of their histones fused, and we don't really know what the reason for that is. So the last chance to ask a question, please. Come on. <laughs> if not, no, there is no question anymore. So then I would like to thank you really very, very much for you. this was a great talk. And uh, as people pointed out, we learned a lot of things we probably don't follow so closely. And uh, so I think uh, it was really a great talk. And I think uh, uh, Professor Zeilinger, Anton, will uh, would like also to say some words at the end? No, I, I, well, I'm speechless. <laughs> but I don't know what to say. I, I found it quite fascinating. And I, I kind of want to, uh, as my fantasy started to wonder. Namely, you mentioned these two standard methods of structural uh, definition, uh, X-rays, which are quite an old method. Uh, as we know, EM, which is also quite old, cryo-EM is an improvement on EM, but more or less, uh, more or less clear. Uh, what would you expect, what would you hope for as the next really big step? What would you, what would you want to know which you can't know with the present, uh, present methods? Yeah, well, if do you have the power to grant the wish? Is that what you're is that what you're proposing? No, um, what you tell, <laughs> tell my theory, friends, always, you know, and don't don't let yourself be limited by uh, the possibilities of today's technology. Maybe something happens unexpected, and and off we go. Yeah, and and you know we've we've had plenty of opportunity to be really uh, surprised and and in indebted to my colleagues who push the technology forward. We're just mere end users. Uh, like I said before to another question, we're really most excited about cryo-electron tomography. 
where uh, where you can look at at nucleosomes, for example, or polymerases working on nucleosomes uh, in the living cell. And what uh, what we also really need is because what we get at the essence with these structural with these structural methods is snapshots of various states. We really want a movie. We basically want to look inside a cell and just observe its business at an atomic level. That would just be fantastic. And it would answer so many questions. And I think it would be very instructive because we would observe that things are much more stochastic than we like to believe. Um, and so a lot of things in eukaryotic cells happen kind of for no good reason at all. They don't, they happen very stallingly. And, and just because we look at ensembles all the time, we get misled into believing that things are always like smooth sailing, but there's a lot of false starts um, in a cell and, and being able to peer inside a cell and then watching it go about its business uh, would really uh, be probably the, the holy grail of structural biology. Well, the question is so long, we have to wait for that. But, but anyway, you know, thank you very much for a really fantastic talk. The question showed, uh, uh, you know, that you hit the, hit, you really hit the target. And uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, we would love to welcome you personally in Vienna. Well, thank you again for inviting me. This is great fun. And thank you for flawless technical execution of this whole process. And I will definitely come and visit uh, when we get out of this whole disaster, hopefully soon. Well, since you mentioned it, I would like to thank uh, Georg Bonner and, and uh, uh, Johannes Bernhard Lindner, who did a fantastic job in making this possible. Absolutely, yeah. All right. Okay. I will see you in uh, five minutes or so. I understand that something like that happens. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. okay. Bye. Bye bye.